This weekend is Memorial Day, originally called Decoration Day because people were encouraged to go out and literally clean and decorate the graves of those who died in service to our country. Whether you call it Decoration Day or Memorial Day, the idea is that we are to set aside and remember the sacrifices that others made in the cause of freedom, to recall the lives that were given and the blood that was shed that we might know liberty in this land. And as great as that is, as appropriate as that is, as wonderful as that is for you to spend time talking to your children and grandchildren tomorrow about what Memorial Day means for our nation, every day ought to be Memorial Day for the people of God. Every day ought to be a time where we look back and remember and reflect upon the cost of our freedom, the life that was offered, the blood that was shed, that we might know real, true freedom and liberty for all of eternity. Now, to have this Memorial Day that I'm talking about tonight, we don't look back to earthly battlefields and to history books, but rather we look back through the power of the Spirit and the proclamation of the Word of God to a battlefield called Calvary and to a truth that is recorded here in 1 Peter chapter 1. Bible students are well aware that this first epistle of Simon Peter was written by the disciple who infamously once denied that he knew the Lord. So right away we have to deal with this wonderful gospel truth that God is well pleased to use mixed up, messed up, cracked up people. He can pick us up by His power, clean us up by His Spirit, and put us back in service for His own namesake. And Simon Peter is moved by the Spirit of God to write this first general epistle to people who were facing intense suffering and persecution. And he tells them how they can persevere and endure in a culture that was absolutely hostile to the name of Jesus and to people who wore that name, he begins really, after a brief introduction, he begins with a word not of encouragement, but he begins with a word of doxology. It is an exclamation of worship rendered in your Bible by the opening of verse 3, praise be, glory be, or blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. John MacArthur notes of these verses that this passage is a hymn of worship designed to encourage Christians living in a hostile world. You feel like you're living in a hostile world? This is a hymn of worship to encourage you, to encourage us to look past their temporal troubles and rejoice in their eternal inheritance. Simply put, Simon Peter is moved by the Spirit of God to write to discouraged and persecuted Christians living in a world system hostile to their beliefs. And if you scroll through your social media feed or watch the evening news, you have to acknowledge we too now live in a world that is not apathetic to Christianity. It is hostile to Christianity. And here we find three things to help us endure and persevere at whatever level of suffering and persecution we may be enduring. Three things to help us Endure the challenges of life, three things to remember. Number one, reading this text, I remember his pardon. I remember the day that the Lord saved me. Growing up in a country Pentecostal church, one of those shape note hymns that we would sing said, I never shall forget the day when all the burdens of my soul were rolled away. It made me happy, glad, and free. So I'll sing it and shout it, for he's everything to me. Maybe you prefer the Baptist hymnal where the songwriter said, I never shall forget the day, blessed be the name of the Lord, when Jesus washed my sins away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And The blessing that begins this doxological text says we should bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because according to His great mercy has begotten us again, literally has caused us to be born again into a lively or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In other words, Simon Peter teaches them and us 
that we can face this day of trouble because of what that day of salvation brought. It's that day that gets us through this day because that day gets us in on the day in which and on which our Lord will set all things right. That is a God-ordained place of worship. As we recognize what Christ has done for us, God will help us to reflect on His pardon. And tonight, as we look ahead to, to the day of ultimate judgment and glorification, Simon says we would do well to look back to the day of salvation, a day of mercy, a day of pardon. Tonight, you'd be hard-pressed to be discouraged and depressed if you just think back to where you were and who you were when Jesus found you, captured you by His grace, washed your sins away, and saved you through the blood of the cross of Jesus. Now, that pardon involves three things that we find here in verse 3. First, I want to breathe a word about a second birth. A second birth, for our text begins... Blessed be. The Greek of the New Testament would give us our word for eulogy. The writer says we ought to offer a eulogy to God because he has begotten us again. That word eulogy, like our word benediction, just means a good word. Peter says in light of the way that God has blessed us through Christ, we ought to return the favor and bless him back. Why should we say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? It's because of a second birth. There are many analogies in the Word of God to describe salvation. Salvation is like a dirty man being cleansed. The Bible says, though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Salvation is like a crippled man being able to walk. Jesus healed a paralytic in Mark's Gospel and said that the physical healing was an example, an external illustration of the fact that he, the Son of Man, had the authority on earth to forgive sin. Salvation is like a leper being cleansed. It's like a blind man beginning to see. And certainly, Lazarus reminds us that salvation is like a dead man being brought unto everlasting life. But here, Simon Peter dips his inspired pen in ink and uses an analogy that ought to be familiar to God's people today. It's the analogy of birth, or in this case, the analogy of rebirth. He uses a word that means to be born again, and he'll use it a second time in this chapter down in verse 23. Perhaps he is thinking back to the account recorded in John's third chapter. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus who had asked, how can a man receive eternal life? Jesus there answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is what? Read it with me. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The word there and here for born again, if you notice in the middle of verse 3, he has begotten us again, caused us to be born again, gives us our theological word regeneration. The idea of creating something, birthing something, is that something has been generated. If it's been birthed again, it has been regenerated. It has been born or begotten again. This is why at Christmas time we sing that Jesus was born to raise the sons of earth, and hallelujah, he was born to give them second birth. Are you grateful tonight for the new birth in Jesus? You see, when a person gets saved, the change is so radical that it can only be accurately described as a brand new person, a brand new creature with a brand new nature. That's how Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 5.17. For there the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Even though I was saved at eight years old, I had just started the third grade, I didn't stop at that time running around with wild women and drinking and doing drugs. But I will tell you just the same. An old eight-year-old knelt at an altar of prayer and a brand new eight-year-old stood up, having been born again by the power of the Spirit of God. 
Even at that young age, the old Mike hated God. The new Mike loved God. The old Mike hated church. My parents had to force me to get up and get ready for Sunday school. The new Mike had a passion for the Word of God. The old Mike, even at that age, sinned and loved it. The new Mike still sins, but I loathe it. And I say with Paul in Romans chapter 7, O wretched man that I am. Now the word picture that is used here is so strong and emphatic that some translations render it rightly that according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Now that language, while helpful, is actually redundant. Because if you were born, somebody else caused that. And if you were born again, someone else caused that. John puts it this way in John 1.13, speaking of those who are redeemed. He said, who were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. I was born on September the 8th, 19, none of your business. It was in Atlanta, Georgia, where my parents lived at the time, and I was born on their seventh anniversary. My mother loves to tell the story of us having the evangelist over. I'm talking about a legalistic Pentecostal evangelist. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Had the evangelist over for pie and coffee one night after revival when I announced that I was born the day my mom and daddy got married. He quickly surmised I was the youngest of three. My mom, knowing that her honor was on the line, quickly pointed out that I was born on their seventh anniversary, and the firstborn child was born right after their third anniversary. Somebody say amen right there. I was there when it happened. I experienced it, but I didn't have anything to do with it. Here the Bible says we ought to bless God Because according to his great mercy, moved by what the Apostle Paul would call the kind intention of his will, he has caused us to be born again. Paul tells it this way to Titus. In Titus 3 verse 5, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. By the way, thank God that's not how you're saved because you can never pile up enough deeds of righteousness to merit the otherwise unmerited favor of God. Titus 3, 5 says, but he saved us according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration. There's that idea of being born again. The washing of regeneration and by the renewing of the Spirit. You were born again. You were pardoned from your sin through a second birth. Now, let me split a hair that needs to be split. You will often hear well-intentioned preachers say that when you come to Christ, God is voting for you, Satan is voting against you, and you get to cast the deciding vote. That sounds good except for one little problem. It's wrong. And you'd better be glad that it's wrong because apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, you would always vote the wrong way. You would always vote for yourself. You would always vote for the devil. And you would die the way that you were born, lost in your sin and headed for hell. That means that you cannot claim credit for being smarter or wiser or more godly than others who reject the offer of grace. You were pardoned when you, by the regenerating power of God, according to the words of the great hymn writer, You were born of the Spirit with life from above into God's family divine, justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has begotten us again. There's a second birth. But notice also in verse 3 a simple basis. On what basis is our pardon or our rebirth Secured. There's just one basis that we find right at the end of verse 3. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He calls it a living hope or a lively hope. How is our hope in salvation living? Why is it lively? Because it's in a living Lord Jesus Christ. Hope in Jesus, church, is a living hope. Because it's hope in a living Lord. This past Friday morning, I was privileged to go to the Waycross Hospital. I went to visit one family, but you know when you walk past the waiting room, 
A wise preacher looks around to see if he recognizes any other faces. And I was privileged to pray with two different families connected to our church. One who would be saying goodbye. One family that would be saying goodbye to a mother and a grandmother. Another saying goodbye to a father and a grandfather. And I say to those that are facing death, what a great assurance that our Lord Jesus has defeated our greatest foe. And because of Christ, we can have a living or a lively hope. This word living or lively is the derivative of the same word that our Lord used in the 11th chapter of John's gospel. You remember Lazarus who had been sick for a number of days and Jesus tarried several days before making his way to the grave of Bethany. And a heartbroken, grief-stricken, and I, I think somewhat aggravated and a little bit ticked off sister encountered our Lord and said to him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again in the resurrection. And she, she said, oh, I know that my brother will rise again at the resurrection. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And this is the same word. I'm the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live For whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus told that sister what I'm saying to you tonight. If you're waiting on the resurrection, what you're talking about is who you're talking to. And what you're looking for is who you're looking at. How is our hope for spiritual pardon secured? How is it firm and steadfast? It's because Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead. I can remember tonight my pardon It involves a second birth, a simple basis, and then a spiritual blessing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's worth noting, again, that the context of this entire book is suffering and persecution. Most conservative scholars would date this first letter from Peter to be somewhere around the year 60 to 65 A.D. Nero was on the throne of the Roman Empire And his hatred of Christ was taken out on Christ followers. In his, what I believe to be his insanity, Nero is said to have burned down his own city of Rome in AD 64 and blamed that inferno on Christians whom he already hated. In response to that, he poured out unimaginable atrocities on Christ followers. It is well noted in history that Christians would be sewn up into the skin of dead animals and they would be hunted down by wild dogs. Believers would be soaked in ancient wax and hung on poles to provide light for Nero's pagan parties. The writer of tonight's text would lay down his life as a martyr under this deep and dark oppression as would the apostle Paul. And yet, Simon Peter says, I've got a faith and a hope that Nero can't touch. I've got confidence that this world can't take away. No matter what I'm facing, no matter what I'm suffering, he dusts off a spot and begins to sing, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Simon says, when you're looking around you and you get discouraged, when you look behind you and you get depressed, don't forget to look ahead. Someone needs to be encouraged tonight. When you look back, you may see an ugly past. When you look around, you may see a dark situation. But when all else fails... Look ahead to the blessings to come. Now tonight, if I told you to praise God for your provisions and your worldly possessions, somebody in this room tonight would begin to protest and balk. and You'd begin to describe how you've got too much month at the end of the money. You may say, Pastor, you don't know my financial situation. If I told you tonight to praise Him for your family, there'd be one or two say, Preacher, my family's got more hang-ups than the old Southern Bell phone company. But if I said tonight you ought to bless him because you were a hell-bound sinner, 
deserving the hell that you would eternally face, but in love and mercy, He came to you and cleansed you by His blood and regenerated you by His power. Tonight, you'd say along with the Apostle Peter, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You might just break out and say, He breaks the power of canceled sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foulest clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm talking about something worth remembering tonight. And this text would say, I remember his pardon. But now secondly, please listen faster on this point. Not only I remember his pardon, but in verse 4 we see I remember his promise. Here Peter continues to turn the eyes of discouraged believers then and now off of this life and onto the life to come. This is one of many reminders in the Bible that biblical encouragement does not come when we convince believers that this is your best life now or how to turn every day into a Friday. Now, that kind of TBN prosperity preaching only works when you're talking to rich Americans living in gated communities, but it won't work on first century believers who are about to be turned into gruesome flashlights for the emperor's party. Peter tells them to take their eyes off of this life And put it on the life to come, and more specifically on the promise of a place to come. Or as Paul would say in a parallel truth in Colossians 3 verse 2, set your mind on the things above and not on the things that are on the earth. Now tonight as I remember his promise, just looking here at verse 4, I want to say something first of all about a sure pledge. A sure pledge, verse 4, to an inheritance. This inheritance is as certain as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Perhaps you heard about the wealthy old widower who was on his deathbed. He had a 20 billion dollar fortune that he was going to leave to his only son. His son had never been married and wanted a wife to share his new billion dollar fortune with. And So he's down at a coffee shop and saw a young woman that he was smitten with and he walked over to her And he said, I may not look like much, but in two weeks when my daddy dies, I'm going to receive a $20 billion inheritance. Please come home with me and be a member of our family. And that's what she did. She went home, and two days later, she married his father. (laughs) That inheritance slipped right through his hands, didn't it? But this is an inheritance that will never slip through our hands because this inheritance is kept in the hand of God Himself. And no matter what this life may throw at you, hear the promise of your Master. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare that place for you, I will indeed come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's a sure pledge, as sure as the promise of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This promise not only involves a sure pledge, but a spotless place. I'm still in verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. How undefiled is this promised place of heaven? It's as undefiled as its maker and builder. For this word undefiled is also used to describe our Lord. In Hebrews 7, 26, describing the immaculate nature of Christ, the sinless character of our Lord, the writer says that Jesus is pure, blameless, undefiled, separate from sinners and exalted above the heavens. And as certainly as Jesus was not tainted by sin... This inheritance will not be tainted by sin either. Lean in close, weary child of God, and be encouraged by the promise of heaven. And be reminded that heaven will be heaven because of some things that are there. Sainted loved ones that will be there. Golden streets, pearly gates, a crystal river, the tree of life. But I don't think we do any injustice to the promises of God to point out that heaven will also be heaven because of some things that will not be there. There'll be no arthritis or abortion there. I thank God for our women's center. You won't need one of those in heaven. There'll be no hospice or hospitals in heaven. I thank God for people who minister there, but they're going to need a new occupation because tears will never stain the streets of that city and death will never 
get its cold clutching hands on those who are there. There'll be no funerals and no farewells in heaven because heaven will be as perfect as its perfect builder. Because of the new birth we have received through Jesus Christ, we should bless him tonight because we have an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled. A sure pledge, a spotless place, note also a steadfast perfection. For verse 4 says that it is incorruptible and undefiled and fadeth not away. This inheritance will never fade away. It will never be changed by time. Have you lived long enough to notice that just about everything else changes by time? Our earthly bodies change. I got up from the table last night, and my wife asked me, what's wrong? I said, nothing. I just heard in places I forgot I had. I said, when I got up from that chair, I was older than I've ever been before. And I can still do just about everything I used to be able to do. It just takes longer, and it's a whole lot louder. I grunt and groan now a whole lot more. Our earthly bodies are fading away. Every week, we see the death angel marching across our foreheads. But we're reminded in this text tonight we can bless God because He's carrying us to a place where our inheritance will never change It is as certain as the promise of God and the resurrection of His Son. Something worth remembering tonight? To look back and remember the day that He saved you. I remember His pardon. Do you you have a memory of being pardoned by God? Now your assurance will not come by looking back to a past event. But if you've been saved, it's because somewhere in your past, you trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And tonight you ought to encourage yourself by remembering the day of your pardon. You ought to encourage yourself tonight by remembering His promise. Thirdly and finally, something worth remembering, I remember His protection. For this we see the end of verse 4 and into verse 5, a reminder that this inheritance is kept by the very power of God. Now before we dissect this verse in conclusion, let me just ask you a question. Especially for those in this room or watching online, listening to this recording later, who believe that it's possible for someone to lose their salvation. Do you think it's possible for someone to be saved and then lost? Here's my simple question tonight in light of this specific text. How in the world could I bless the Lord, give Him glory, and thank Him for His deliverance in the past And for my inheritance in the future, if that deliverance could be forfeited and that inheritance could be lost. When I was a freshman in law school at Mercer University, what what law school students would call an L1, one of our professors talked to us as we were learning about writing last wills and testaments. And he said, when you begin your law practice, The last client that you want is going to be a little old lady or a grumpy old man. They're going to come in and they stay mad with their kids and grandkids. And about every two weeks, they're going to be back. Write this one in. Write that one out. Write this one back in. Write that one back out. The question of this text tonight is, is that how our inheritance is with God? Does He see us on a day of good behavior? And say, write them back in. Does he see us when we stumble and when we fall? And say, they didn't come visit me today at my house. So write them out. No. Our salvation and the inheritance that is secured through that salvation is as sure as the power and the protection of God himself. I love the story of the old woman who wanted to go skydiving on her 90th birthday. And she got up in that airplane with the parachute on her back, but she got nervous and didn't want to jump out of the plane. Who could blame the 90-year-old woman? So they radioed down to the radio tower. She said, help, I've gotten up and I can't fall down. (laughs) Well, tonight we can bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because through His mercy, 
He has lifted us up and seated us with Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. And we have no danger whatsoever of falling away. Now we can bless him tonight for his protection. For three reasons that we find at the conclusion of verse 4 and then into verse 5. Number one, let's look at that guard. Look at that guard. Look at the end of verse 4. Reserved in heaven for you. Reserved. Now that word reserved is also rightly translated as the word kept. That this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Or it's being guarded in heaven for you. The idea of it being reserved in heaven for you speaks of a down payment. If you've ever needed to rent, for example, a U-Haul trailer, you go and you make a reservation. They will often want your credit card, some down payment, some earnest money. Or you get online for your upcoming vacation and you want to book a hotel room and reserve it. They will usually want a credit card to put on file. A payment needs to be made in advance, ensuring and guaranteeing that the promise is going to be made. In this context, however, the word reserved, kept, or guarded is a picture of a, of a literal guard, a corrections officer, a soldier, or a sentinel standing guard to protect a treasure. I went online and got some information about Fort Knox. Fort Knox is where... The American gold bullion is stored. Some $270 billion in gold bullion kept at Fort Knox. Listen to these statistics about the guard that is there. The exterior walls at Fort Knox are made of solid granite, so thick that it could withstand the dropping of an atomic bomb. The front door weighs 22 tons and is operated by an elaborate combination system and works on the hydraulic system. The combination is constantly changing to make sure nobody sends out the combination. The foundation of that storeroom is made of multiple layers of cement and topped with a granite slab that is 10 feet thick. The vault itself is too large and complex for me to describe here, but in order to even get to all of that, you've got to go past the forces of Fort Knox itself, an army base that is home to more than 30,000 troops. I tell you that simply to say, compared to the security system that is guarding, keeping, and reserving my inheritance in heaven, Fort Knox may as well be the Mayberry Jail, guarded by Floyd, Goober, and Otis after he's put down a fifth of liquor. My inheritance is in a place Guarded by the maker and builder of heaven itself. The guard is none other than Jesus Christ. Kept, guarded, reserved in heaven for you. Look at that guard. Secondly, listen to this guarantee. Now I'm in verse 5. It's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Our inheritance is being kept by the very power of God. What a guarantee that we will receive this inheritance. Now, the Bible says that a godly man leaves an inheritance for his children. And I have an inheritance on this earth because of the wise decisions of my parents. But if you understand anything about earthly wills and earthly inheritance, you know that even at this stage of life, at best... It's not secure. For example, my mom and dad could still lose everything they've got. How many of you grandparents know they've got grandkids and great-grandkids, plus two daughters and a favorite child? And if any one of us had some medical need, and my parents had to divest themselves and liquidate everything and spend it all, They'd spend every dollar of my two sisters' inheritance. They may have need to sell everything. My parents love me, but they wouldn't be the first parents to get upset about something and write one of their kids out of the will. The government, upon their death, could confiscate so much of it through confiscatory estate taxes. 
But I'll tell you one way I may not ever be able to receive any inheritance from them. I may die before they do. My dad may eulogize me at my own funeral. There are a lot of reasons that any potential inheritance in this life is insecure. But my inheritance with God is secure because God is the one guarding it and guaranteeing it. My inheritance in heaven, child of God, your inheritance in heaven is being guarded by one whose power has no limit, whose might has no rival, whose strength has no equal. The Apostle Paul was so impressed with this guarantee. He said, for I am persuaded or I am confident. I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I can remember tonight and bless God for his protection because I can look at that guard, listen to this guarantee, finally long for the glory, long for the glory. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In the last time. One of the reasons that we struggle on days like these is because when we keep our eye and our focus on this day and take our eyes off of that day. But here the word of encouragement for which we bless our God and Father is because of what He has in store for us ready to be revealed in the last day. A few years ago, went to preach at a Bible conference, and ended up staying in the dirtiest hotel room I have ever had to stay in. Quite frankly, I would not normally put my dog in that hotel room. I didn't say anything about it because I didn't want to be that guest preacher. But I went out to my truck, and I remembered because of hunting season, I had some kind of tarp out under the back seat of my truck. And I went and I spread a tarp out over that bed and I put on long socks, sweatpants, and a hoodie. And I cinched that hoodie up where I could barely breathe out of a nose hole on that hoodie in fear that some funk would make its way out of the carpet and invade my respiratory system. I mean, it was nasty. But let me tell you what I did not do. I didn't go down to Home Depot or Lowe's and get some items to renovate that room and it's really just for one obvious reason I wasn't going to be there long enough for it to matter that's really what Simon Peter is encouraging us with tonight he has already in the opening two verses reminded his readers that they were aliens pilgrims strangers traveling through he writes to some Jews that had been scattered to different countries in what was called the Great Dispersion. They were literally foreigners, strangers, pilgrims, and aliens in other literal foreign lands. But he wants them to know that while that is true from an earthly human perspective, spiritually, they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, even if they were still living in their homeland. That's what the word alien means. It means to be a foreigner. Someone that is not from here and ultimately does not belong here. Tonight I close by reminding you that if you ever want to see an alien on planet earth, you don't have to go to a sci-fi movie. You want to see an alien on planet earth, boys and girls listen carefully. If you know Jesus, tonight you can go home and see an alien by looking in the mirror For the Bible says that we as believers are just passing through this world. And when tests and trials come, we should bless God, our Father, because we don't belong in this world. One gospel songwriter put it this way, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Jesus. Christ. Tonight I close by reminding you that because He has saved you, gave you a promised inheritance in heaven, 
and secured it by his own power. You ought to say on this Memorial Day weekend, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.